Experience a new level of luxury on Topsail Island at Saltwater Suites in Surf City, North Carolina. With no nightly minimum, you can enjoy short getaways or an extended stay. Each suite features luxury bedding, full kitchens with dining tables and dishwashers, and all suites other than the three ADA suites have full-size washers and dryers. And don't forget about those beautiful ocean views. 24-7 self-check-in provides a hassle-free and seamless experience. Saltwater Suites is the perfect choice for your next beach getaway. Book your next Topsail visit at saltwatertopsail.com or call 910-886-4818. Saltwater Suites, Topsail Island's premier luxury hospitality experience. Welcome to the Topsail Insider Podcast where you can hear all about the businesses and events in the beautiful coastal towns of the greater Topsail area of North Carolina. Coming up, you know when you're driving down Highway 17 through Holly Ridge and you see all the flags and the signs about custom framing and photography? And have you always wondered about what was back down that road in that industrial area? Well, you're about to find out. That's Above Topsail and JW Portrait Studio, owned by none other than the mayor of Holly Ridge, Jeff Wenzel. Such a great conversation with him. You're going to want to stick around for it. Let's get to it. Welcome to Topsail Insider Podcast. My name is Krista and I am your host. Today, I have the honor of interviewing Mayor Wenzel of Holly Ridge, North Carolina. Aside from governing the town of Holly Ridge, Jeff Wenzel is the owner of Above Topsail. He provides custom photo and video services to the folks and businesses in the greater Topsail area. Welcome, Jeff, and thank you so much for joining me today. Yay, I'm so glad to be here. Yay. Thank you for inviting me, Krista. My pleasure. So before we go into all about Above Topsail, which we're going to go over thoroughly, I just want to ask you a few questions. Okay. So in the pre-interview, you mentioned that the mayor of Holly Ridge resigned, and then you were appointed mayor. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of that term, you were re-elected mayor. And I just found that that was a very interesting journey. And I wanted to know, did you have political aspirations before being appointed? None at all. Never saw myself being in politics. How did you get to a place where you could be appointed? Coincidentally, four years ago, as I was just driving around Holly Ridge, I was seeing the the yard signs for, Mm -hmm. you know, elect so-and-so for for town council. And I was just convicted that I didn't really know most of the people who had the signs out in the yards. And And so the the Topsail Area Chamber of Commerce put on a meet the candidate forum. So I decided to go to that. And so they they ask one question and then each candidate answers it. And then they start the next question with another person. But the question was, what is one of the current issues that Holly Ridge is facing that you think you could help with? All the incumbents had great answers. And every single one of the person who was running who was not part of the town council all had basically the same answer was, I really don't know what Holly Ridge is dealing with, but whatever it is, I'm just going to throw my hat in there and just help out. And I said, that's a terrible answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, if I was ever to run for town council or mayor, then I think I'd go to a few meetings beforehand and just, you know, sure. learn to see what was going on. And so I was just convicted. So I started going to some meetings. So this was four years ago. How mm-hmm. long have you lived in Holly Ridge? I've been there 15 years. 15 years. So yeah. you know what's going on in Holly Ridge. You know what Holly Ridge needs. So that, that's when you got involved in just start attending the meetings. meetings. Mm-hmm. So on the day that you were appointed, did you did you know that that was coming? Yeah. So the 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 mayor, uh, Miss Anita Dingler, she moved out of Holly Ridge into just a different house. Okay. Uh, but she moved out of the corporate limits, and so she resigned. And then in North Carolina, any town less than fifty thousand residents, rather than call a special election, which is a lot of cost the town council will appoint someone to fill any vacant spots on the town council. And so they they just put out, said, anyone who's interested, give us your name, give us a letter why you think you'd be good. And then they did an interview process and and they picked me. During the time that you were appointed and you were finishing out that term, what experiences or challenges led you to run for re-election? So when I was appointed, I, I really unlike candidates now who like they have a platform, like I want to work on this and the the parks or infrastructure or whatever Mm -hmm. case may be, I really had no agenda. And so within the, you know, the first year or two, I found what I thought I was good at and found a passion. And and really a lot of that has to do with economic development. And so that's how can we bring in jobs 
that will bring in good paying jobs so that the people who live in Holly Ridge, because it's, it's a bedroom community, still is. People mm-hmm. live here, but they go to Hampstead. They go to Top, so they go to Jacksonville, the gotcha. Wilmington to work. So how can we get good, high quality paying jobs right here in Holly Ridge so that people can not only live here, but work and play as well too. Mm-hmm. And that's one reason why I think I was appointed because I am a local business owner, as we're here talking about. Right. I've done a pretty good job of marketing myself as a photographer. And mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, I had a couple of council members saying, we think you can market the town and talk to I other see. business owners yeah. and developers from your perspective. Mm-hmm. The, the fish market that was in Hampstead has now relocated Atlantic into a seafood. new facility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and now they're in Holly Ridge. Was that a boost to your local economy? Absolutely. So it's kind of funny that you mentioned Atlantic Seafood. So mm-hmm. I was literally sworn in, took a couple of pictures with my wife in front of the town hall. And then the town manager says, I need to talk to you in my office. And I was like, oh boy, I've oh, already no. messed up. <laughs> so I get in there and she's like, I need you to sign this non-disclosure agreement because I'm talking to you about a, a future project and we have to, you know, everything needs to be shielded until it's official. And sure enough, it was like, we have um, Atlantic Seafood, who's possibly looking to move here to Holly Ridge or, or another place. And I said, oh, the Smiths. I played softball with Jeffrey and Joseph. And, Get out. Uh, I was the third <laughs> baseman at Scottsdale Baptist Church softball team. And Joseph was the shortstop and Jeffrey was in the outfield. She's like, you know them? I said, I do. I said, tell you what, let's, let's all get together for lunch. And that's so, awesome. you know, that's one, exactly one of the things like, do I have the relationships with the local mm-hmm. businesses and companies and, and stuff like that? Right. And so, so yeah, that turned out working out well. You also have the new RV, RV Oceans resort. RV park, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's a whole new, it's like, you're really bringing it in. Yeah. That's, that's 224 lots that they have available. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they just up and running 10 little mini homes that people can rent on a sh- very short term basis. I saw them. They're so cute. S- super cute. And they have a pickleball courts. They have dog park, putting greens, swimming in-ground pool, swimming pool, yeah. laundry facilities, dog park, fitness, all the stuff right here. So it's right behind Holland Shelter Creek Restaurant, mm-hmm. right there on Highway 50. And so, yeah, just. It's There's just a lot right going there. on. Holly Ridge is taking off. It's I love booming. It. All right. Well, good. I would say what achievement up to this point are you most proud of? But it, it, it sounds like that's it, bringing in these new businesses. Am I right? It is. One of the biggest things that has happened is UPS is going to be building a major distribution center in the Wait, industrial what? part. Yeah. UPS. Next summer, they're going to be open if everything goes as planned. That's huge. Yeah. It's larger than the Wilmington facility, larger than the Jacksonville it's huge. That, they flew in their marketing director. Uh, it was a huge announcement last year. And, and so, yeah, it's it's really big. That must uh, feel amazing. It is. Just the amount of jobs. 95 jobs. And the average pay is 64000 with full benefits. And they're going to need full-time drivers. They're going to need part-time people working in the warehouse. Um, but it's going to be a big distribution center right there in the Camp Davis Industrial Park. Literally three lots over from Atlantic Seafood. Look, I mean, we're exactly halfway between Wilmington and Jacksonville, mm-hmm. run right on Highway 17. So they, can, if they're getting stuff from the port of Wilmington, if they're going to Albert Ellis Airport or Wilmington Airport, however they need their goods coming in or out, we're just in a prime location for right. that. And you've got all that space there for the big industrial mm-hmm. sector. That's great. That's such good news. I'm so glad to hear that. So these are successes that you're having, but what's been the biggest challenge? You know, one of the best questions I was ever asked was I, I was speaking as the mayor to a local Boy Scout troop. The, the toughest question I've had was, what's the hardest thing you've had to do as a mayor? And I sat there and thought about it. And I think the biggest thing is when there are multiple good options on the table, but you can only pick one. And so you have to tell someone no, mm-hmm. even though it's a good option. It's just you, you can only pick one. And so you have to tell people that are friends. We're just oh, not going to go yeah. that way. So that's, that's the toughest part is when you have to make a decision when, you know, it's easy if it's, there's, we have a good choice and a bad choice. Okay. That's an easy decision. Mm-hmm. But what if there's multiple good ones? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can understand that. So, I mean, why wouldn't you run again? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm up for re-election in two years, but there's so many things that go into it. It's not only just the job itself, but you know, I have two young kids, nine-year-old and Deacon will be 13 in two days. You know, wife what business that I run. And so who knows in two years from now what my, what my kids will need from me at that time. How is the strength of my marriage in two years from now? What does my wife need from me? What does my business need from me? So I want to say there's just a lot of factors that go into it. It's, it's simply more than just, I want to do it again, but what does people that are close to me need from me at that time? So let's talk about how you do balance that. Cause that's a lot. You're, you're a family man. Mm-hmm. You've got a booming business is doing, it, it appears to be doing quite well. 
and now you're also governing Holly Ridge. So how do you find that balance? And then what about just time for yourself? Well, I don't think I'm unique in any position. Those three positions may be different for me, but you, you're, you're a mom. You have two, two boys. Mm-hmm. You're a wife. You are balancing this podcast endeavor that you have here. Kids are in sports, church, yes. all these things right here. So I'm no different from anyone else. I have the same 24 hours as everyone else. And we just all have to figure that, that balance out. I get it. I hear what you're saying. But that mayor thing <laughs> just is a whole nother element that I can't relate to at all. Well, I rely on good people, good people in my business to mm-hmm. run the business when I need to be out. But we have a great town manager who, who runs the day-to-day activities and mm-hmm. oversees all the employees. You just have to have good people that, that you empower to do what you need them to do and try not to undercut them. So delegation, although that's hard, especially as an artist. So let's get to Above Topsail. Tell me, I've got this right. It started out just a hobby. Mm -hmm. And then Above Topsail was just drone photography. Mm -hmm. And then that turned into a whole lot more, which we're going to get into. Tell me about how it started as a hobby. So I I was in the Army for three years, grew up in Northern Illinois, went into the Army straight out of high school and ended up at Fort Bragg. When I got out of the Army, I was dating this girl, and I knew if I moved back to Illinois, I'd probably mess up a long-distance relationship. So I was like, well, if I'm going to stay here, I'm going to need a hobby, because all I've ever done is lived at home or lived in the barracks. And so now I'm out of my own, and what am I going to do in my evening time? So yeah. I've always enjoyed airplanes, general aviation. So I was like, yeah, I can go down to Hayes Hobby House in Fayetteville and find me a model airplane. And so I said, what's the best model airplane to learn and learn how to build and learn how to fly? And so... Model airplanes have been my hobby on and off for the past 26, 27 years. By mm-hmm. the way, I married that girl. We've been married 25 years. So it was a good decision. Oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> so model airplanes and, you know, living on topsail area, uh, it's beautiful. It is. It's gorgeous. Sunrises, sunsets, beautiful color water, everything. So mm-hmm. I always just thought it'd be fun to mount a GoPro camera up on my model airplane and just take pictures or video of topsail. Mm-hmm. I never got around to it. And so uh, I just bought a drone that had a a DJI drone that had a camera built into it. So Mm -hmm. it eliminated figuring out how to mount the the camera on there and turn it on and off. And so uh, I could fly the drone really easy. It's the model control type of stuff. So the flying part was easy, but I didn't really know anything about photography. Didn't own a camera. And so I was taking pictures and a lot of them were pretty bad, but every once in a while I get a really good picture. I was like, well, why is this picture better than all the other ones? And so I figured, well, there must be some type of um, formula. And so I just started watching YouTube videos on photography and the best camera settings for my drone. And and sure enough, I learned the basics of photography, such as lighting and composition and stuff like that. And I'm one of those people where I'm all in or all out. Mm -hmm. And so I was like... I get that about you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I was like, you know what, I'm going to be the best photographer that I can be and post these pictures on Facebook and... And so friends started saying, oh, that's a really good picture. Do you mind if I like printed it off or, you know, hang it on my wall? I was like, sure, go ahead. So I had enough people do that. I was like, hmm, I wonder if there's a market for drone photography yeah. on Topsail Island. Now, there had been photographers who had rented airplanes and, and for decades taken aerial pictures and mm-hmm. sold those. But there was no one who was, and there's people who had had drones before me on Topsail Island, but there was no one who had marketed drone photos to the Topsail area. Mm-hmm. And so being the entrepreneur I am, I went and started talking to frame shops and boutiques and stuff. I said, hey, I take these photos. I'd love to sell them. And, and so As I was, artwork. Mm-hmm, I was first to market for drone photography in Topsail Island. Okay. And that was eight years ago. And then people were like, hey, I want to sell this house. Can you take some drone pictures or drone video? And that's anyone who buys a drone, that's the first place that they go to is like, how can I make money off this drone purchase I bought? And mm-hmm. they immediately run to the real estate market. And now realtors have their own drones now as well, too. So yeah, that's that's how I started off with with selling the artwork. And rather than trying to sell it out of one location, it was actually counseled by a couple of people like, just sell it in one or two places, make people come here. It's kind of exclusive. But it was the two brick and mortar places that were encouraging me to do that. And so I, I, I decided, actually, I'm going to do a different marketing philosophy. I actually want my artwork to be seen everywhere. Or even rather than open up my own brick and mortar on the island, mm-hmm. on Topsail, um, and try to pay a high rent and attract people to that. Like, I wonder if, if I could put it out in enough places that tourists who come for the week, stay at Topsail, if I could put it in enough places that they organically see it throughout the week. 
then that'll be my marketing strategy. And so my goal is as someone goes about their week and they go to the coffee shops and they go to dinner at restaurants and Mm -hmm. all the stuff that my goal is that they will see my artwork 10 times throughout the week. So more like Coca-Cola, like everyone sells Mm Coca-Cola instead of being, you know, a place that attracts them to. So that's that's my marketing strategy. Very smart. It's out there now. Now, how would you describe your style of landscape photography? So I love the colors of sunrise and sunset, you know, the oranges, the purples, the yellows. And all sunsets and sunrises are pretty, but I really love it when there's clouds. I kind of use this analogy. All sunsets are like popcorn. It's good. But man, if you put some clouds in there, that's like the, that's like the butter the and butter. the salt. Because <laughs> the light will reflect up off of them and it'll change their colors and the texture of the clouds. And so you'll see a lot of my images also have clouds teamed with sunsets, yeah. sunrises, and also landmarks, Topsail Island. And so that's actually how I got my name above Topsail I take pictures from above Topsail. That's the story behind my your name. My name. How long did it take you to come up with the name? Did it just come to you one day, <laughs> or because people really search for that perfect name? Yeah, and you got one. Well, actually, I got ten because I also <laughs> registered above Surf City, above Hampstead, above Wilmington. I registered all on GoDaddy. I bought all those domain names. <laughs> so don't even think about copying. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just settled. You know, what's a generic one that would work for me? But yes, yeah, my landscape photography. If you were like someone from California who's never been to Top Soul, if they come across my website, they'd go, eh, that's nice. But not like, that's an awesome shot of that random pier with these clouds. I'm not that good of a photographer where if you don't know the landmark, you're not going to buy it. That's oh, just realistic. Okay. Mm-hmm. So my photography is good for the average person. But when I team it with a landmark of Topsail Island with a beautiful sunrise, sunset, all of a sudden that image is great. Because what I've discovered is I'm not selling a canvas wrapped around wooden stretcher bars to hang on a wall. I'm selling someone's memory of that pier yes. that their husband, now husband, got down on his knee and proposed. Remember oh, that one got, sunset? I just got chills. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, fishing on the pier. One of my most popular images, there's a gentleman who's in this, it's not a wheelchair, but it's one of those motorized scooters, and he's wearing this pink hat. And that's one thing that's really neat about drones is you can put a camera in a unique position that you normally can't. And so this image that my drone is just right off the edge of the pier, but not, but on the ocean side, but it's looking back on the pier. There's no way you can get that angle or shot. Even if you were to have a boat you would have to be so high up on the deck and so yeah. close to the pier that it, it wouldn't work. So mm-hmm. the, the drone is, is a tool for, it's a flying camera for my purposes. And so I took this picture and I always wondered about that gentleman. And, you know, there's lots of people in there, but photography, my job is to find and tell stories. And I always wondered, what is the story with that, that gentleman? Never knew, but it was just a fun image. So it just happens that um, I received a, through my website, my abovetopsoul.com website, where I sell my artwork, I received this message through my contact form and says, hey, um, my, my dad is in this picture on the end of the pier. He's wearing this pink hat. Oh, my um, gosh. And I just want to know when you took this because he's passed away. No. <laughs> so. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so I. That's one of the things, instead of just emailing back, I, she contact form, I get, I get the information. So I called yeah. her and I said, well, I actually took it. You know, it, was, it was Thanksgiving weekend of this particular year and just silence. And then I heard sniffing. Mm-hmm. She said, that's the last time my dad fished. <gasps> and uh, oh my so gosh. I said, well, here's the funny thing about that. Mm-hmm. Not funny, but I said, this is, it's very blue. There's like, there was no sunset that night, but I had just gotten a drone that day. And so I went out to go catch the sunset, but there was no sunset. So normally I just pack up and go back home and spend time with the family. But yeah. because I'd gotten drone that day, I said, well, I'm going to fly and just see how it flies. And so I went out there and took this picture. But I, I said, you know what? I also took a video. Oh my gosh. You sent that to her. So I got video of him casting. Wow. So uh, the lady who had reached out to me, she said she had um, breast cancer five years before and so her dad always wore the pink hat that was the identifier. i don't even know what to say yeah i still get emotional i know 
Wow. I can't even believe this story. Like that is amazing. I started crying too on the phone. I said, it, it, it's, it's ironic. Three weeks ago to this day that I was having this conversation, my dad had passed away. So here's two complete strangers just... Just connecting. Connecting over the phone. So. I'm sorry for your loss. Mm. I'm speechless, but I, I'm so happy that you captured that moment. Exactly. At just the right time. And you two were able to get connect yeah. that way. I'm assuming you gave her the the video as well. Well, I knew I had a hot commodity, so I tripled the price and sold it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I laugh only so I don't cry, Krista. I gotcha. No, I don't know. yeah, I, I, I sent them a few. And, and then when um, I said, next time you're in topsoil, because they still had to come and clean out the, the, the fishing shed and all that stuff that mm -hmm. they had. And so they came and see me. We gave each other big hugs and cried a little of bit course. more. Of course. Thanks for sharing that with me. But that's what photography is. We capture stories. You do. And that's why I team my artwork with people's memories of Topsoil. Mm -hmm. And most of my sales, I get a lot of local sales, but most of my sales are people from Pennsylvania and New York and mm -hmm. West Virginia, Ohio, all, all the Midwest um, and Northeast, because that's who comes down to Topsoil to vacation. And so they're buying the artwork and either taking it back or we ship it to them. And they, you know, they're saving up throughout the, the year to afford their vacation. Right. And so that's kind of like, we're going to go see that pier again. Mm -hmm. where we had that great time with the family. Last time the whole family got together. Yeah. I, I just feel really just acknowledging you you capturing these memories for people. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. That's an incredible story. And I, that's what's great. I do the same <sighs> thing with portraits too, like family portraits and high school senior portraits. And mm -hmm. I just have story after story of, you know, I, I literally three months ago just took family photos of a family whose the father has stage four brain cancer. And knowing that, and knowing that this is probably the last family photo. Right. That's a lot. That's, brought an extra uh, battery just to make sure I didn't run out of batteries. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. You're not just helping them. They're actually affecting you, Absolutely. your life. They're helping you. I get to be invited into people's stories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's special that people either share the story or entrust me with capturing their story. Mm-hmm. And I get to get paid and support my family with that. So, I mean, that's, that's why I have passion for photography. I'm going through your portfolio in my head right now. It's just like cycling through the, the senior portraits and the family photos, of course, and just to how important those will be to these people for decades. Mm. I feel very grateful to have that knowledge mm. with me now. And when I look at your work, and now I actually can't wait to go back through your photography on your pages and... Mm. Will I find the pink hat? Yep. Oh. Drone photography now in the evolution of my business is secondary. It's just an accessory. It's it's part of a package, but it's mm -hmm. typically not the, the, the full package. It's where you started. Before we move away from the drone photography, anyone that's new to the area, we had a swing bridge mm. in place going um, from Surf City over to the island. And that was replaced by a huge, gigantic bridge, which mm -hmm. I, I love. But that was such a beautiful landmark for Surf City for so long. And they tore that down. But you found a way to use parts of that bridge to create artwork using your uh, drone footage of that bridge. Mm -hmm. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about how you did that? So the swing bridge opened up in 1955, wow. November 55. It lived there and served the community well until December 2018. And that's when the new high rise bridge in Surf City opened. So I was just taking pictures of the new bridge as it was just starting to be built. Honestly, not even the bridge, but just the, the structure, support structures that they'd bring in the big yellow cranes on. They, mm -hmm. they were building those. And sure enough, the, the contractor reached out to me on Facebook and said, hey, like your pictures, would you be interested in taking monthly progress photos for us? I'm nice. like, yes, I would. Yes. I would be interested in that. <laughs> so I was taking monthly progress photos. If I photos. must. Yes. I mean, I was going to do it anyway, right? Um, so and that, that's what's neat. I mean, find, if you're an entrepreneur, find something that you love. I, as you said earlier, yeah. if, if you find something that you love, then you never have to work another day in your life. So I was going to take pictures anyway. But yeah, and so, you know, 12 pictures a month, blah, blah, blah. Send it up to a Google Dropbox. Boom, they got their pictures. Pictures. You know, I got my little bit of cash each month for that. But anyway, um, so I was taking the picture, developed this relationship with the construction company that won the contract, got towards the end 
of the new bridge being built and the contractor were trying to figure out what to do with the swing bridge Mm -hmm. because the NCDOT had written as part of the contract of building the new bridge was they had to completely remove and dispose of the old bridge. Oh. Part of the contract. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. So they were looking for anyone to take it. Mm -hmm. They were going to offer it for free as long as just pay to move it. So they Mm -hmm. offered the town of Surf City, offered individuals, and they just had no takers. But they had a lot of people from the public coming to them saying, hey, I'd like a a piece or a A nut or a bolt of the bridge. And and so they came to me and said, Jeff, we build bridges. We build highways. We're an $11 billion a year company. We don't sell parts or memorabilia. We're not staffed for it. We don't have like e-commerce website, but you do. So since I'd built this relationship with them, they they knew I, I did quality work. They said, let's Let's figure out a price and then we'll provide you with, you know, a set amount of pieces and then you can make them available to the public. Do what you want with them. Just mm-hmm. make them available to the public and we can direct them to you. And, and so that little public, public oh, win for them. I see. Yeah. And then an opportunity for me. And okay. so we settled 700 pieces. So we just finished Autumn of Topso a couple of days ago. It's the mm-hmm. annual festival in October down in Topso Beach. I literally just sold the last two pieces. Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> you told me that you had two pieces I left. Did. I'm they're like, wonder gone. how long they're going to last. And one went Saturday, gone. one went Sunday. Oh, someone's very lucky to get yeah. those pieces. And I literally, I took, I took a picture of me with the family that bought it. Nice. And so I, you know, like this, I actually, I got a little emotional then too, because oh, you know, this was a big, big piece of. And did, of it, did anyone else take a part of that? So I was able to get a six foot section and donate it to the Historical Society of Topsail Islands. So oh, down in the yeah. Missiles and Moore Museum, yeah. there is a six piece, six foot piece that that's there for people to look, touch, remember the the green of it. How many pieces you started off 700. with? Seven hundred, and you just sold the last two. Mm-hmm. Okay, so tell the listeners what you did with those pieces because it was very, it's very cool. So four hundred of them I put onto a maple wooden piece of wood. Mm-hmm. It's actually technically a cutting board. So okay. a local cutting board company made and laser engraved Surf City Swing Bridge 1955 to 2018, yeah. Surf City Swing Bridge. And then um, we mounted an X looking piece with a rivet in the middle to it. I think it was like 12 by 16 was the size. And so 400. And that was, I mean, it still wasn't cheap. But that was the economical option. And those actually sold out in five weeks, 400 of those pieces. And wow. then the other ones, the remaining ones I put on to a 24 by 36 canvas of an image that I had taken the morning that the new bridge opened. And so I Mm -hmm. I entitled that image, The Last Sunrise, because it was the last working sunrise of the swing bridge. And if you look closely, you'll actually see people standing on the bridge, just kind of taking in the last few minutes. The canvas with the attached piece of the bridge, you also donated that to an auction. That was auctioned off at the Real Housewives of Topsail Island's annual bike ride. How much did it go for? I think each one went for a few thousand dollars. A few? Yeah. Tell me if I have this right, because Miss Annette Ernie, I interviewed her, and I think she told me about this. You auctioned off one. Mm -hmm. I donated one for the auction. Donated one, and it went so well, and people were battling it out over Mm -hmm. this this piece. And you're like, okay, I'll donate a second one if you for the same price that it just auctioned off for. Yeah, I literally interrupted the auctioneer and said, "There's a second one now available." (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. So let's talk about your portrait studio. Tell me about JW Portrait Studio. When did you switch over or when did you add in portraits? So eight years ago, started above top. So with the drone photography, Mm -hmm. that was going good. But, you know, I was thinking, you know what? I wonder if I could make enough money in photography to support my family full time. I didn't think I could just sell in topsail aerial artwork. And so I was like, well, what are my options? And so thinking through, I said, well, I could go down to Wilmington or maybe down to Southport and you know, take pictures down there and then try to build relationships with the local shops and coffee shops. But like I said, most of my my pictures are sunrise and sunset. And so you go back five years ago, my kids were three and seven. And of course, sunrises and sunsets are when they're bedtimes and awake times. Yes. And then I'm working during the day. And so Mm. I had to decide, do I want to take myself away from my family to get more images at different locations, plus I'm driving. But you can't guarantee a good sunrise, sunset. And so some trips are wasted. And so, well, if I don't want to do that right now, then what else can I do with photography? I said, well, what are some other types of photography that I could do? And so I was like, what if I did portrait photography, but just stayed in the same 
topsoil area. Uh, and so I decided to do that. Tell me about your studio. It's quite large. The yes. whole facility is large yeah. back there, actually. Yeah. So we're well hidden, and that's that's a curse. But right on Highway 17 or in Holly Ridge, we're, we're in the, the Gulfstream steel complex. So we're off the road. And so we got all these little A-frame signs out front that says, like, topsoil artwork and picture framing and business headshots and all You're that stuff. off the road, but you get my attention when I drive by. We just got a billboard yeah. too. So now, oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> right now the billboard up there has a little kid with a camera and it says, let's do shots. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I am going to get people's attention one yes. way or another with this <laughs> billboard. So, and I'm going to change it pretty frequently. So cool. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so we're in this industrial complex, we're literally in, a, in the 1960s era metal storage building but we've invested a lot to like when you walk in that front door my vision to my employees is we need to change people's perception like they walk in they're like whoa nasty looking metal building gravel going over a speed bump all of a sudden they walk through the front door and it's nice it's yes. well lit the mm -hmm. floor is nice i wasn't expecting this and it's very intentional of course everything's an investment to do something like that but i mean we literally mm -hmm. plan and we have like all these scents that are plugged in. So when people walk in, I want to engage as many senses as the possible. Visually, we have music playing. Yeah. I want them just to be in an environment like they're walking into like a gallery, even though two it seconds feels earlier. Like a gallery, yeah, yes. that's the plan. So we're we're off the beaten path. We're not on the island. And quite honestly, when I got it, it was more for manufacturing and production rather than people coming in for artwork. But once I put it on Google, people started Googling and they're showing up. So I was like, oh, man, I, I guess I need to have like open hours. It's staffed now that we have hours six days a week. We now expect people to come in and okay. shop. And of course, now with the picture frame shop, people come in all times throughout the day to drop off their artwork and get quotes and all that stuff. And so, gotcha. Yeah. So the studio is there. So what we are blessed that we have low rent because we are off the beaten path and we're in mm -hmm. this metal building. But the challenge is we are off the beaten path. Right. So, but yeah, but we've invested quite a bit of money to make it nice so we can change that perception when they walk in. OK, so you do have the framing mm -hmm. part of your business is back there. You've got your printing part of your business and then you've got the studio, which is in a, a separated space a little further back, which came first. It didn't all happen at once, I'm assuming. Yeah. Or did it? So I had a small 20 by 20 portrait studio in Surf City that I had rented the year before I moved in here and I moved in four years ago right when COVID was starting, actually. And so I had a little 20 by 20 space. It was actually in the same building as Salty Turtle. So Salty Turtle owns or has half oh. the business and then Providence Physical Therapy has another one, mm -hmm. the other half of the building. So I was subleasing a small room from Providence Physical Therapy where I just, I wasn't making any money at mm -hmm. it, but it just gave me a dedicated space, not in my living room, yeah. <laughs> which my wife thought, thought was a great idea to uh, <laughs> set up my lights and learn portrait photography. And so I, I did that. And so I, I wanted to uh, expand that a little bit, but I also wanted to take printing of my canvas artwork in-house. And so I decided, well, I want a larger studio, but at the same time, I need to find production area for the printers and then all the woodworking equipment, all that mm -hmm. stuff. And Did so, you know at the time that would be another whole business in itself, or were you just doing it to create your own artwork? Just do my own. I wasn't selling any portrait work printed at the time, just digitals. It literally was just to print my artwork and do my own. But turns out these big printers, they want, they like to be printed each and every day so that the, the ink continues to be pushed through. So I, was, I sat there and thought, well, if, if I have this great resource of this printer and then all this equipment to build this, the frames for the stretcher bars, I might as well print for other local artists and, and painters at the same quality of my stuff. And I'm, I'm really proud of the quality of the materials that I use. And so I offer that to other local artists and photographers. And most of my clients are artists and just a few photographers we print for. So I have a graphic artist. And so they'll bring in their originals. We digitize them by taking a high quality image of it, well lit, everything like that. And then what makes us unique in the area is I have a graphic artist who is phenomenal at matching the colors of the originals. So here's the, here's the thing. Every camera has a little bit of different, like a Sony camera has a different color temperature compared to a Canon camera. And then the lights, how you light it, they have a different temperature and then different mediums that, that you paint on. 
will also reflect different colors. Mm-hmm. And then you throw in the, the brand of printer that you have and the type of ink that you have. All That's those are lot. variables. It literally takes someone who is very well trained. And, and AJ, my, my graphic designer, has a four-year degree in graphic arts. And so he, he literally uses all of his skill set. And what we do really especially well is match the original colors of the artist painting mm-hmm. as best as we can mm-hmm. to our reproductions. And that's kind of what sets us apart from anyone else who would do it. Interesting. Or if you just took your own picture, then uploaded it to a, a budget place, you mm-hmm. just don't know what you're going to get Mm-mm. because you took it with your phone, you take it with a real camera, they don't know. And so that's one thing that sets us apart. I never thought about that as far as a printing business is concerned. If you're an artist and you're selling these and it's your work that you're displaying, you absolutely want those colors to match. That's a great thing that you can offer. And speaking as a fellow photographer, I I get to manipulate the colors as I see fit. But Mm -hmm. the artist has intentionally used certain colors and they want their reproductions matched as best as possible. Sure. Me as a photographer, eh, it can be a little bit bluer, it can be a little bit more yellower. I don't care too much, but the artists <laughs> mm-hmm. are very, I mean, they spent hours and hours totally. and hours picking those colors. And so that's why we print a lot for artists because we nail, and we're not cheap because because of the quality that we do. And mm-hmm. so a lot of photographers are like, eh, I can get it cheaper. And I was like, you sure can. But if you... But the colors won't match. Well, they may. They, they may might. Not. But yep. the artists really, um, the painters really... Most of them appreciate the level of effort and detail and and what we do for them. You also shoot family portraits. I did Mm -hmm. see some outdoor portraits as well. So are you still doing the outdoor work? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You do business headshots Mm -hmm. and uh, you do have some really cool athletic shots. I want to talk about that just a little bit. Is most of that done in the studio? Uh, 50-50. So I shoot families, Mm -hmm. a lot of family portraits. I would say 95% of those we do outside. Why not? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we're at the beach or the woods or um, their grandma's dock or just wherever's a special place for them. And senior high school seniors, in particular, and college seniors too, but high school seniors. I, I grew up playing baseball and even played football my last year. And I just remember my pictures, like my senior picture on the football team was kneeling in the middle of the field in bright daylight. So I'm squinting a little bit yes. just on one knee holding this football. And I mean, the picture's great. It's good, and I'm glad I have it. But when I was getting into portrait photography, I was like, I want to take pictures of our, like, the people get excited about it, especially athletes. I want them, I want to take pictures that could be on, like, ESPN, the magazine, or the cover of Sports Illustrated. So cool. Yes. So that's that's my style. I call it high dynamic, dynamic or high impact sports photos. And, And so I shoot a lot of flash photography for that to get really cool lighting, yes. fog machines, yes. colored lights, all these things. And then, of course, the things you can do in Photoshop as well, too. Mm-hmm. So literally, just yesterday, we're out on the golf course, and it's a golfer for Topsail High School. It's a high school senior. We're out on the golf course, and I had bought these three-pack of exploding golf balls. Yeah. <laughs> so you hit it, and just all this powder just explodes. And oh, my gosh. loved it. I we bet. Had the killer, it's, it's going to be the cover shot of his album, his senior album. And and so it's, you know, that's that epic shot that, yeah. that I love getting. And, I, and I'll show the back of the camera. And it's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, just <laughs> I want to see that passion, yes. you know, because you, you, these athletes, they spend in all their waking hours balancing the, the multiple things that they mm-hmm. have. And to get that killer shot, that epic shot is just is so exhilarating for me knowing that I got that for them. And one thing that makes us different from other uh, photographers in areas Everything in our business, whether we're framing something for someone's wall or whether they're buying a topsail artwork piece for someone's wall or whether we're printing for another photographer or Mm -hmm. an artist that are putting something on the wall, everything has to deal with putting artwork on walls. And so even with our portrait studio, we are a full service portrait studio that's print based. So Mm -hmm. we help people get the artwork on walls and the artwork is their family. A lot of people just will, will take pictures and give digitals. And I've had so many people, when, and that's how I started. And some people come back and say, I lost the link. And I was like, that was a year and a half ago. Yeah, well, we never did anything with that. I mean, we loved them, but we just, we just got busy. And so a, a couple of years ago, I switched over to uh, a product-based photographer for families and seniors. And so mm-hmm. we helped them through the whole process. Not only do we meet before them to, to plan the shoot, but then we do the shoot. And then a couple of days later, they come to the studio and we have this in-person reveal session. Now we got the 75 inch TV in the small room mm-hmm. and we get to show them their pictures and we get, we get, I get to watch their face. Like, oh, that's yes. awesome. <laughs> uh, 
and then after we identify the pictures that they love, then we say, okay, well, how are we going to make sure that these get printed? And so we have these albums and we have the canvas and metal and acrylic for the wall. Mm -hmm. And we have these beautiful announcements for the high school seniors. And we have all these little gift items for, for families, families that for grandma or special aunts and uncles yeah. where they can get these little small mini albums. It costs a lot more than just a lot of other photographers, but mm -hmm. you get so much more as far as the value we, and the quality of printing is just phenomenal. The labs that we partner with for these albums and everything. Mm -hmm. And so, and then. They come in and it's literally in a gift bag and with tissue paper and they, it's like Christmas morning. They get yeah. to open up and they get to see their family pictures as artwork. I and think it's so important. And I do know that you promote that. Like this is not to live in your device. Yeah, It needs to be up on your wall. And I think we have so much storage space in our devices now. We just go around snapping everything and there's not many that we print. Mm. I think it's so important that you take and capture those moments, but then you get it up on the wall. Most pictures live on the internet. The best pictures live on walls. The best ones live I mean, on the walls. I walked walls. into your house, and what did I see going up your stairway? My two boys. Your two boys. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, we can look at our phones, and and if we get great pictures taken by photographers, and after a couple of days, we've scrolled past them. Now, in a year, we'll get reminded by Facebook about those pictures. That's right. <laughs> and, and two years after that, and three years after that. But why not have them printed on the wall? And, and then we also do professional hanging. So if someone is going to drive to my studio to get their pictures taken and come and do the in-person viewing session and ordering session. And then if they want me to come hang the wall, I come, I come hang the, the canvases on their walls for them. I mean, if they traveled to me, why would not I travel to yeah, them? Yeah, that's nice. Of course, all that's built into our price point as well, too. But mm -hmm. we are a full service photographer and it's not yeah, for no everyone. Kidding. I get it. But by being at a higher price point, it enables us to not be overworked as well, too, mm -hmm. and give that extra special attention throughout the whole process to mm -hmm. our, our clients. Let's talk about those high school senior portraits, because you mentioned that you really enjoy shooting those. And I just wanted to find out, maybe you could share the reasons why you have such a passion for this specific type of photography. Yeah, well, growing up as an athlete myself, I, you know, I've literally had, like, we, we've shot pictures of teams of younger teams, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds. And I've had the coach come up to me after we delivered the pictures a couple of months later, and he goes, they actually played better the week after because they just had more confidence. Like they that? saw themselves. And I was like, how cool is that? And we do a lot of these senior banners that mm -hmm. hang in gyms or on the chain link fences going into the stadiums. We do the awesome photography. We do the printing of the banners right in house so we can do a fast turnaround and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Not the cheapest again, but <laughs> but man, they're super cool and, and the kids love them. And then they, they travel, the banners travel with the kids to their dorm rooms. They literally just live forever yeah. on these senior banners. I don't know when this podcast will come out, but our, our next billboard is going to be a, a picture of a high school senior football player. Really? Of Topsville High School. And so that should be going up in the next week. The senior girls. Mm -hmm. I know that they are also doing the athletic photography, but you mentioned the fashion flair yeah. for their senior portraits. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? I just love fashion photography. I love, you know, the edgy outfits, the edgy lighting. Photography is a lot with lighting and, mm -hmm. and how you can light someone in a flattering manner and angles and pose and all that stuff. And so mm -hmm. a lot of that has to deal with um, fashion photography. And so I really study that. And so... I have this great space, dedicated space that I actually have a, a huge client closet of clothes and props up above. Um, my wife is jealous of all the women's clothes <laughs> that I own. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, fashion photography, I, I certainly, if if the high school senior girl is into that, or the boys as well, too, I, I mm -hmm. certainly will integrate that into their senior session as well, too, and, and get nice. some some really cool fashion-y type of shots in the studio or outside as well, too. Okay. Let's talk about your custom picture framing shop. Tell me a little bit about that. So I never planned on that. But when I got out of the Army back in 96, I actually worked at a picture frame shop. Oh. Well, that was my job out of the Army um, on Fort Bragg. And, and so not only did I work there, but I taught classes to the military and the spouses twice a week on just entry to picture framing at the You Do It shop there in Fort Bragg. And so I did that for five years while I was going through school, you know, continued dating my wife and got married and all that stuff. It was just a, a season of my life. But it was very helpful when I was looking to buy the equipment, the woodworking equipment to use to build the stretcher bars for our canvases. And so I knew exactly what equipment to get to not only cut, but join those, those stretcher bars. Uh, and so I just had a friend come to me and said, Hey man, I, I, 
but this frame broke. Is there any way that you could fix it? I said, yeah, bring it by. I got all the equipment. I'll, I'll fix it. And then like a couple of weeks later, someone's like, hey, I got broken glass. Is there any way? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I got the, all the equipment to be able to cut the glass and all that stuff. And I was like, huh, what do I need to be a full picture frame <laughs> shot? And literally it was one piece of equipment. It was a piece of equipment that mounts artwork to the backing material. And so bought a used piece, drove down to Georgia and, and got that and then and hooked it up. And that literally was the last thing that I needed to be a complete custom picture frame shop. And so then I was just getting the samples of the picture frame molding and the mat boards and yeah. dedicating some space to it. And so, yeah, that's the, that's the fourth entity of above top. So it was it a really just all picture makes frame sense. shop. But like, it, it follows our philosophy or, or our mission of putting artwork on walls. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I would like to move on to your personal life, if you don't okay. mind. You mentioned earlier that you were from Northern Illinois mm-hmm. and the Army yep. in Fort Bragg brought you to North Carolina. Do you miss Northern Illinois? Do you ever think about, do you, do you visit a lot? Do you think about going back? Or you're, you're permanent here, Mr. Mayor, right? No, yeah, I'm permanent <laughs> here. Um, no, it's way too cold up there, I'll be honest with you. I hear you. So uh, <laughs> I grew up in Freeport, Illinois, which is just west of Rockford, which is two hours west of Chicago. So right about 10, 15 miles away from the Wisconsin border. In fact, my high school is the Freeport Pretzels. The Freeport Pretzels. Really? You can eat us, but you can't beat us. That was our little tagline. <laughs> Isn't that oh terrible? Gosh, no. Are uh, you we had t-shirts and everything. Are you, that said, are you pulling my leg? Serious. Because you pull my leg a lot. No, no, no. Google it. Freeport pretzels. So, yeah. <laughs> so I went into the army straight out of high school. And <laughs> actually, I was still 17 when I went into the army. And in fact, I was in airborne school down at Fort Bragg when I turned 18. And eventually, quickly, I got, because I was airborne, I got to Fort Bragg. I really enjoyed my time in the army. I'm also really glad I got out. It just wasn't <laughs> for me the structure and whatever the case may be. I'm very glad to be able to serve my country. It allowed me time to, to grow up, it gave me Army College Fund and GI Bill to be able to pay for schooling. And, gotcha. and that's ultimately what brought us to Wilmington was transferring to UNCW for computer science. And so okay. graduated in 2022, moved to Hampstead for five years, and then um, been in Holly Ridge for the last 15. But yeah, met my wife while I was in the Army. I was actually, I was in a singing group, the 82nd Airborne Division Chorus, which no one knows about <laughs> until you watched America's Got Talent. This literally is within the last couple of weeks. They were a finalist on America's Got Talent. How about um, that? Same, now everybody knows about the them. The same group that I sang in at my wife's high school. She was 16. I was 19 when I just met her by chance at a high school assembly. We, we, we sang there uh, and then we just became pen pals and, you know, the rest is history. So that's what brought me to Fort Bragg and then North Carolina and then UNCW brought me to Wilmington and in a job in Jacksonville straight out of college took us to the Hampstead area. So gotcha. that's kind of the transition for me. We've been married 25 years to Lindsay. Just 25 years. 25 Congratulations. Years. Got a little girl who's nine and a little boy who is 12 now. And in two days, he turns 13. We'll have a teenager. Now. Wow. All right, so we have come to the end of my podcast, oh. and it's been wonderful talking to you. The last thing I like to do is something called Final Thoughts, and I just want to find out what is the one thing that you really want the listeners to know about you, Jeff Wenzel, or Above Topsail. I guess people were to think or just know that I'm passionate about whatever I'm doing at the time. I have a lot of drive in me. And so whatever I'm doing, I'm going to do the best that I can. And I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. And so I'm going to do formal and informal education to do the best that I can at whatever I'm doing at the time. Yeah, I think people can see my passion for whatever I'm doing. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what I look for when I'm looking for team members to join the team. I want someone who has a passion for something because, I mean, I, I, I don't pay my employees enough. I, I wish I could. I wish I could pay them double what they're making. Um, but if you can find someone who loves what they're doing and provide a neat and I mean, we still got to get the work done, but a fun environment, mm-hmm. then, then people will come work for you. And then if you invest in them and also just realize that you only have team members, employees, whatever, whatever you refer to them as, you have them for a season. And so, you know, you have to realize that you have people for a season when they do choose to move on for whatever reason. You can't take that personally. I mean, this is my business, this is my livelihood. I take everything personally, but you got to not do that, especially when dealing with team members. Do the most that you can for them for as long as you have them and then wish them well when they make a decision to leave for whatever reason and help them out and, and then find people who are passionate. That's, that's what I would say. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming here and sharing with me the way that you have. I really appreciate it. And I can't wait for the listeners to hear this episode. It's going to be so fun. You want to talk about your contact information? Sure. You can find me, of course, right on Highway 17 in Holly Ridge by the stoplight. There's only one. I'm directly across the street from City Cafe in Holly Ridge Tire. And you'll see my signs out front and my billboard now. But to stop in and see us, we have regular business hours. I may be in or out, but um, I definitely have a staff that will greet you and, and offer to give you a tour of our facility. You can find us online at for Topsail Artwork at AboveTopsail.com. And then people can find out more information about my portrait studio at JW for Jeff Wenzel, JWPortraitStudio.com. And of course, we have all the socials that have the same names as well, too. Uh, the address is 301 U.S. Highway 17 in okay. Holly Ridge. May I give out the phone number? Mm-hmm. It's 910-803-1759. And what email address do you want to put here? Uh, Jeff at AboveTopSale.com. All right. Well, thank you, listeners, for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And thank you again, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Hey, thank you for joining me today on Topsail Insider. If you liked today's episode, please hit the follow or subscribe button so that you can get the Topsail Insider podcast delivered automatically to whichever podcast platform you're listening on. And if you're a business owner and you wish to set up a pre-interview or you want to advertise, please email me at topsailinsider at gmail.com. Please also find and like the Topsail Insider Facebook page. I provide links to the new podcast there each week, as well as providing photos of the businesses that I'm highlighting along with any of their upcoming events. So, hey, let's do this again next week. I'll see you around Topsail.